So we'll um, begin today's sutta class. And today we are, I think, um, on page 116 of our book that we're following, Social and Communal Harmony. And um, so I'll begin by reading the sutta. So we're... Um, yeah, halfway down the page. So, this sutta is, for, is from the Anguttara Nikaya, and uh, it's the Anguttara 20, even though there are 10 things, that's interesting, Anguttara 20, and number 31. And it is called The Reasons for the Training Rules. So, the venerable Upali approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said to him, Bhante, on how many grounds has the Tathagata prescribed the training rules for his disciples and recited the Patimokkha? So, well, so this is obviously the training rules refers here to the monastic training rules. And um, in particular, the Patimokkha rules is what this sutta, this, um, uh, this uh, question is about. So um, it's a very interesting, this is actually the first, first, usually when we have Vinaya classes, this is like the favorite sutta. <laughs> that starts off Vinaya classes. So I've heard it many times on many occasions. But um, so this is very interesting because it is a sutta on, on why we practice the Vinaya, on how many grounds has the Tathagata prescribed the training rules for the disciples and recited the Patimokkha, meaning what, how many grounds is like, on, on what are the reasons for having these, for us, 311 rules. I mean, yeah, and that's a lot of rules, people say. So, but why do nuns keep 311 rules <laughs> and monks keep 227 rules on what grounds? So this is like a very interesting sutta. So, it is Upali on 10 grounds that the Tathagata has prescribed the training rules for his disciples and recited the Patimokkha. So there's not one reason, but 10 reasons. That very good reasons for why nuns keep 311 rules and recite it every, well, well, when there are four nuns, they recite it every party, party mokha. Every two weeks, we re, 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 revise, revise our rules or we remind ourselves of our rules and um, uh, what we call confess a, or, or, or acknowledge any, any ones that we have sort of um, um, missed, those that are for acknowledge. There, there are various levels of rules, but that's another story. Okay, so what 10 are the rules that, that, why are these 10, the rules have been prescribed? So the first one, for the well-being of the Sangha. Two, for the ease of the Sangha. Three, for keeping recalcitrant persons in check. Four, so that well-behaved monks can dwell at ease. Five, for the restraint of influxes pertaining to this present life. Six, for the dispelling of influxes pertaining to future lives. Seven, so that non-believers might gain faith. And eight, 
for increasing the faith of the believers. Nine, for the continuation of the good Dhamma. And 10, for promoting discipline. It is on these 10 grounds that the Tathagata has prescribed the training rules for his dis disciples and recited the parting of birth. Ah. So it may seem that these training rules are only about nuns and monks, but actually, you know, as, um, as this book is really about, is for we all live in, um, you know, whether it's in a, a, a workplace or um, society in general, there are sort of sometimes unwritten codes of conduct Conduct and unwritten rules that that uh, that um, we kind of we kind of um, adhere to as as groups of people. So it's really interesting how we keep these rules, whether it's at in a in a workplace or whether it's um, yeah, if it, it's formal as like the Vinaya is. So, but how do we hold rules and how do we um, uh, relate, to, relate to another person when there is a, a, a rule involved or an unwritten code of conduct? Um, yesterday, Paul was here and he was talking about his office and, you know, the disharmony there is, I'm sorry, Paul, if it's private, but anyway, the, no problem. But yeah, uh, the disharmony there is when there is, a group of one person uh, thinks this way, another person thinks that way. And it's very difficult when you're the one in the middle and you've heard to hear this person's version of what, how things should be. And then you have to hear that person's version of how things should be. So um, these unwritten rules are something that makes our life, uh, it guides our life and, and uh, well makes our life e easier. So um, this, I think, is 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 actually, you know, like or, or like uh, one of the reasons that the Buddha gives is that for the first one is for the well-being of the sangha. So, uh, like the situation Paul was in, it's just simply having having certain ways of doing things. So, for example. Ooh, don't keep your dirty mugs for three days in the office while, <laughs> while you have while you're you've gone home, you know, over the weekend you come back and there's like a dirty coffee mugs <laughs> on people's desks. I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is a thing. But uh, you know, it's just simply for our, our just the well-being. It's for the um you don't have to hear. One person saying, ah, that person left them more coffee mugs lying around, you know. <laughs> and you get, oh, they did it again, sort of thing. So it's just simply for our, our well-being. So a lot of these rules, there's uh, different types of rules, but they're just simply so that we have a common understanding so that the uh, dishes are done at a certain time and that um, they're not left there until the next morning and somebody's irritated that the dishes haven't been done again. So therefore, uh, just generally, not that something is wrong about it, but it's for, uh, for just the overall ease and harmony of a group of people. So a lot of Vinaya rules. And um, when Varchanda was saying the other day that uh, um, uh, Vinaya rules, they really fall into two categories. There are rules that are ethical and that there are rules that are just simply social, social norms. So there's nothing wrong about, ethically wrong about leaving a coffee cup for three days in, <laughs> or in your office, you know, <laughs> while everybody walks around it. But it is just... Uh, it's 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 nothing wrong, but it's just it's just uh, for everybody's just common understanding. So that's the first reason that um, that rules are there. It's just for a 
general well-being and um and harmony and living together so so it's not that you are a you know that it, it's bad or it's um evil that often we get get it oh no i didn't do the right thing that's it's i'm bad for having left coffee cups lying around i'm saying this because my cousin <laughs> my cousin once was driving me and the and our abbot back back to the airport and he said gosh it sounds like monastery sound just like my office <laughs> <laughs> anyway and it was the coffee cup <laughs> So, um, yeah, so the first rule is that, first reason is that it's just generally for our ease and well-being, nothing wrong, but it's just um, easy to have a common understanding that um, you don't have to, you don't have to worry, you know, you don't have to worry. It would be nice to have a set of rules for families, isn't it? <laughs> Lord, it would be nice. My mother wouldn't be shouting at my dad so much. Why have you once again <laughs> left your mugs lying around in front of the TV? Just bring it to the kitchen. Anyway, you can't do that. Yes, so that's the first reason. So the second reason is for the ease of the Sangha. So it's very similar to the first one. It's for the ease of the Sangha. So um, uh, like in, in our monastery, when I come in the morning, I know it's so nice. I know somebody has, this is in Damsara, there's like, we all have our, our jobs. I know that someone has set up my seat and opened the windows and I don't have to think about it. I have to come up, come up in the morning and go, gosh, you know, where am I going to sit today? Or, Where's the cushions or anything like that? It's it's just so easy because it's all set up. I don't have to, I don't have to worry. Or over here, Grace rings the bell at seven o'clock and we have breakfast. So that is very easeful. Don't have to worry where my meal comes from that day. I don't have to go onto the streets and and start begging. So that is very easeful. So that's the second reason for having certain sort of routines and rules. So the third one is for keeping recalcitrant per persons in check. Aha. So uh, for keeping recalcitrant persons in check. What's recalcitrant? Mm -hmm. Impulsive or people that don't want to like um, behave properly. Rebellious. Rebellious. <laughs> Recalcitrant person. Me as a teenager. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I guess when you, uh, uh, this, is, this is always the case, you know, there are rules and someone says, but why are we doing this? It's stupid. Or, you know, I mean, uh, I had, you always have a really yeah so um so this brings so it brings to your mind you know why am i not wanting to follow this rule is it because i'm um just uh, being uh, i have a, a a good reason or is it coming from recalcitration <laughs> recalcitration <laughs> that's nice <laughs> How did I know what recalcitrant means? <laughs> but it's good to reflect, you know. Uh, this is not to judge. Ah, there you go. Who with an obstinately uncooperative attitude. Okay. <laughs> it happens to all of us. <laughs> I see it in myself. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> good luck to you. I'm off. But yeah, so just to notice that not to judge others, others by or I judge, it's very easy to judge others, but so it's not to judge others, but uh, to um, notice it in ourselves. What is our motive? Is it obstinately uncooperativeness? Um, and in which case, yeah, that's what. Uh, uh, the rule brings up for us what is our what is our relationship to it uh, not that it's particularly right or wrong but how are we relating to it what part of us is being 
recalcitrant. What part of us is like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so um, yeah, to notice that uh, ten, that uh, that mind state um, is uh, very useful. Rules do that to people. So yes. So the fourth one. So that well-behaved monks can dwell at ease. That's nice. So that's what uh, um, Paul, for example, wouldn't be suffering at work if if uh, there wasn't um, it, it, it. Others would be be at ease. You know, one person isn't complaining about the other person, and um, uh, yeah, the the. Yes, those who are really not not um, not wanting to get their heads filled with <laughs> complaints can dwell at ease. So that is very nice when um, people live in harmony. Um, so six for the dispelling of influxes pertaining. Oh, sorry, five the restraint. Yeah, the restraint of influxes pertaining to this present life. So that is a lot of what um, the the vinaya and even you know the precepts that we keep are. It's not that it's um, uh, bad to eat after six after midday, or it's bad to sleep on high and luxurious beds when you keep the eight precepts or however many precepts you keep, or it's bad to handle money or, you know, or listen to music or what all these things, but they help us to restrain our mind. And then um, Vrachanda has been preparing her talk for um, a Sunday at the London Insight and uh, um, telling me all about sense restraint. So, but this is what the rules help us to do. This is what um, keeping the precepts help us to do. It helps us to prepare our mind for um, for for something more beautiful, which is um, samadhi. So the vinaya and the rules are there to help us to notice where am I going out into the world? Where am I? Um, um, where are my senses going? How am I? How am I using my mind? How am I? Um, oh, to kick it makes sense. Okay, no. yeah, yeah. So um, uh, this is kind of the basis of our our, our meditation practice. Like when Chanda's talks will be on Sunday about that keeping sila for us three hundred and eleven rules. But however many rules you vinaya you keep, it is the basis for a mind that is ready for meditation. We spend so much of our time sitting there trying to meditate, trying to get our breaths to one place, get our mind to stop thinking, get ourselves to stop being hard on ourselves, all these problems that we have in meditation. But uh, it is actually the vinaya and the sila that we keep that is the platform, the basis, the foundation on which um, the mind is developed. So this is what the Buddha says. It is for the restraint of influxes pertaining to this life. Yeah. Hmm. Did you want to say anything? Okay. So we'll just keep going. And at the end, people can say things. Uh, and so the next one is interesting too. For the dispelling of influxes pertaining to future lives. So um, it's for the long haul. It's not we are training ourselves in a particular way. And um, often we think, you know, how come I behave this way? Or, or, or It's because we've been doing it for lifetimes. If you've been... Um, um yeah certain hab habit patterns 
that you have, you don't know why, because it's just because you've been doing it for lifetimes. So the way we behave now, the way we um, um, look after our minds now is, uh, is uh, going to be how in the next life or, or lives to come is that's how your mind is going to incline. So it's, it's very powerful, really, every moment that we that we um, restrain our minds is um, heading it in a particular direction. So not to be underestimated, the power of restraint and the power of the of training your mind on very simple things on a day to day practical level. Yeah. So number seven, so that non-believers might gain faith wow so whether you work in a um, organization or whether you uh, you are working for the sangha you know you have a repute when when especially as a sangha member when you see sangha members not keeping the vinya it is it is very very sad and very um uh, bad karma quite honestly for oh for the Sangha because well, someone loses faith in something that is very, very profound, very important, very powerful. And um, we've seen in churches and even in Sri Lanka, you know, I mean, all institutions when, um, when the, when the community, the leaders of the community don't act with integrity, don't keep the vinya, don't keep the sila. It kills the whole society. I think in, in I know Ireland, which was such an Irish or Catholic country, and the the way they disparage um priests now because of um well all the uh well, stories there are of um, abuse in the church, but it's tragic. Well, I, I used to go to Ireland a lot because my ex-husband was Irish. So, um, and um, interestingly, he's a monk. He's a monk now. He's a Buddhist monk, not a Catholic monk. Anyway, he's a Buddhist monk. And he says in Ireland, he's the, they despise, despise really someone in a robe. And um, at um, yeah, if he sits on a if he sits on a bus, people don't want to sit next to him because he's Irish, mind you, because he's wearing a a, a robe, a Buddhist robe, even not even a not even a, a collar. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, priests can't. This was a couple of years ago. My mother-in-law used to say that um, priests can't walk on the streets of Dublin at night; that they'd get um, they'd get things thrown at them so this is the this is the this is the actual reality of when um, the people lose faith so it's quite 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 real yeah yeah and uh, even in 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 sri lanka i mean when <clears throat> yeah yeah, my uncle gets so angry at monks that that misbehave or in, are in politics. And so, yes, it's not a pleasant thing. Not a pleasant thing. And even, even in an organization, when you hear of an organization at work or whatever, that is, uh, you know, that they're, they're, they're not um, treating their worker, their people well, or they are not honest there's just a distaste and it 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 bears on the reputation of your institution of your company of your family when you hear somebody is they are not um, behaving well so yeah yeah so and it incre it's for the increasing of the faith of the believers and uh, so when you do see monastics behave beautifully, it is so inspiring. It draws you to the Dhamma. It draws you to uh, want to emulate them. It draws you to 
see what is it that this person has that I don't have. I want to be like that. I want to be peaceful. I want to be at ease in the world. So when you see someone who is um, living beautifully, you inspire others to um, follow follow whatever it is you're doing. And that's uh, that's one of the great things that the Sangha does that anybody does when they behave, when they act beautifully, that they draw others to, to, to uh, follow them, to um, learn what they have learned and find happiness in the same way that they have found happiness. Yeah. Um, so number nine, for the continuation of the good Dhamma. So, this is uh, what we have been doing for 2,500 years from one person, one, one person to another. Um, the word of the Buddha has been handed down. Very often it is the Sangha that is the, the custodians of the, the Dhamma. It is um, the Sangha that memorizes it, that studies it, and that passes it on to the little samaneras and samanerings were the next generation and uh, yeah the 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 sangha has been the custodians of the dhamma for 2500 years so it's an it's a real um no yeah it's a it's it's no small thing that we have the dhamma to so many years later so for the and yeah, the continuation of the good Dhamma and for promoting discipline. For promoting discipline. Wow, I wonder what the Pali of that was. It sounds like, yeah, promoting discipline. Hmm. I guess promoting vinaya or promoting um, from, uh, that, that sila is valuable. Maybe that's what the point is. Anyway, it sounds like promoting discipline. Hmm. So it is on these 10 grounds that the Tathagata has prescribed the training rules for his disciples and recited the Pati Mokka. Yeah, so that's quite a lot. And like I said, usually when we have a Vinaya class, we spend like a whole one hour on this particular sutta or probably a couple of days even. Um, but uh, there's a lot in there. And um, to me, it took many, many years to get my head around head around why, why and how one holds a rule and how one relates to rules and how one, you know, um, yeah, how one keeps them. So it, it was, um, yeah, it took many years for me to actually understand this sutta, even I probably don't, but anyway, even at least to kind of get my head around it. So, um, yes, so I, I'm just, uh, we'll stop here and maybe uh, uh, if anyone has anything to ask or to. Um, Can to I go... come to the thing on the box? And, mm, and yeah. answer that? Okay. Because it's been there a while. Okay. I come to the box, yes. Mm. I just want to answer this one mm. and then. Um, yeah. Sure. So this is just really interesting because a couple of people have given other um, definitions of recalcitrant. Mm. So one, the root, someone's saying is to kick, mm. you know, to kind of kick a storm, mm. kick against, like mm. to kick your way out of something, mm. which is really interesting. That's mm. probably what teenagers tend to do. <laughs> and this is even more interesting that recalcitrant has calcium in its root which means hard, if you think of something that's calcified, right? Mm. The hard mind, the calcified mm. mind that won't change. Mm. Oh, no. Mm. <laughs> which is very interesting that the idea of a hard mind is actually there in the word recalcient because uh, recalcitrant, mm. isn't it? Um, because a lot of what I teach, and Ajahn Brahm as well, um, who I'm inspired by, teaches about softening the mind and the Buddha as well. Right, he's teaching how to purify the mind from those impurities, and the analogy he gives is like purifying gold of the impurities that harden it and make it brittle. So that's really interesting. And then um, the same person's asking, 
What happens if my recalcitrant mind doesn't want to be restrained? <laughs> so no problem because a recalcitrant mind is a mind that doesn't want to be restrained. That's exactly what a recalcitrant mind is. So the obvious solution there is to purify and soften it. The recalcitrant mind won't be trained. But the thing is, the mind is not fixed. It's not one way. It's changing constantly. And there are certain things we can do to soften it. So don't try to train a mind when it's in that state. I think at that point, you have to just observe, oh, look, this is the mind that's kicking a fuss. This is the mind that's pushing back, you know, on, on wanting to be trained. So probably it's because you're pushing it too hard. You know, that's what happens again with teenagers. I mean, if somebody would have said, well, don't go out and don't dress like that, I would have kicked back and dressed even more punk rocky or glam rocky. So that wouldn't work, you know. Um, and if we treat our minds that way and tell them not to be the way they are, our minds are not going to be happy with us because it's not our mind's fault. It's causes and conditions. And it's mostly the causes and conditions you've put in there. <laughs> so um, the most important thing is to just notice the state of that mind and notice the suffering of it the contraction of it the kind of brittleness of it and see that clearly and then understand the causes for softening it so things like loving kindness things like being really gentle things like developing faith reflecting on your good karma on the beautiful things that you're doing to bring some gladness to the mind so anything that helps to undermine the hindrances, because this calcium or whatever that's got in there is basically hindrances, right? Ill will or restlessness or boredom, whatever. Uh, so anything that undermines them. Contentment is another really um, great kind of perception to develop. But I think, yeah, give yourself a lot of metta because it's also mm. a suffering mind. So metta mm. not only softens it, but it also relieves some of that suffering too. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, everything's right with punk rock and especially glam rock, actually. <laughs> Someone said nothing wrong with it. Correct. <laughs> so I can see the repercussions of the heads of governments acting in ways that are not in the good of the people, such as present day France and we in Canada have a great example of a politician who was a great leader. He inspired people across different party lines. Wow. Yeah. How wonderful. It's always nice to hear good news. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Inspiring leaders. Um, um, yeah is uh, another inspiring leader was Jacinda Ardern, oh, who was yeah. the, unfortunately, she also uh, stepped down as prime minister of New Zealand because it was too, she had nothing left in the tank, she said. I get it. <laughs> yeah. well, strangely not enough, not popular in, in her own country. Some of a part, par anyway. Never mind that. Okay, so, but <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, very inspiring. When an, a leader is inspiring, the the people behind are you are uplifted when you hear about, even if you are not from that country. When you hear mm. about inspiring leaders, it uh, just makes your day. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay, so that Bill has his hand up. Yeah, you can. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, okay, okay. Ask to unmute. Sorry, sorry. Oh, I've done something. No, it's fine. Uh, okay, you can unmute. Bill. You ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Did I? Uh, okay. okay. So I put in the chat. It was part of what I understand. Nod your head if you can hear me. Nod, nod your head if you can hear me. I'm freezing. We can hear you, Bill. Excellent. So part of what I, and I put it in the chat too, part of my understanding regarding the rules is so that the male monks don't try to take advantage of the female monks, that, which is why there, there are extra rules, which I, I'm not sure if that's your understanding. 
is the job. So I have so much said that nuns have extra rules so that men don't try and take advantage of nuns. Yeah, uh, uh, actually a lot of the um, Vinay rules that there are just so many more for females was for actually they're just safety. A lot of them are about um, women's safety because, um, well, it just wasn't safe to be a, a female living by themselves in um, India in those days in a forest. So, um, yeah, that 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 is true. I mean, there are a whole heap of of, of um, uh, extra rules that actually there aren't that many more in the end. Um, some of them are just broken up or um, uh, are not really relevant in this day and age. So it's actually that not that much more. But it's yeah. interesting to me that when there are a lot of bhikkhu rules, the bhikkhus often say, well, we are just in higher training because nuns only get 10 rules. So the more rules, the better. But when it comes to nuns having more rules, everyone thinks, oh, that's a problem. That means nuns are less. But actually, by the same logic, it should mean that we're in much higher training, isn't it? <laughs> so I don't know. This is very arbitrary to me because it's really about the basics. You know, it's about learning not to harm oneself or others and doing performing actions and deeds and restraining ourselves in ways that are for the benefit of oneself and others. And that's it's really something we have to learn to observe. We can't every time we want to know, kind of get our book out and find out. We have to get the book of our heart out, right? We have to actually learn how to read our own emotions and our own, um, you know, reactions and, and figure out, um, as is possible for a human being, whether a particular action is wholesome or not. So it's not about rules. Should I do a question? Yeah. All right. I'll uh, do a question from the box. When I started going on meditation retreats, I was quite young, 17. Mm -hmm. The rules were something I struggled with, mm. not because I was rebellious, but mm. rather the opposite. I was mm. afraid to do something wrong. Mm. This brought some tension and performativeness mm. to my body and gestures, which took away from actual mindfulness, mm. I think. Is it possible that the rules can also be limiting in this sense? Mm. Yeah, I think this is where we have to apply things in ways that kind of are appropriate to our own conditioning so one of the thing that things that took me kind of years to understand is that certain traditions for example which are very strict on retreats or talk about working really hard or you know fighting out your battles and whatever this is really helpful in countries where people lounge around on deck chairs and are very kind of survive survive they don't really you know <laughs> do very much and maybe you know it's hard for them to kind of make it on time so it's very good in that case if somebody's effort is a little bit weak or they're more inclined to do not quite enough to say, do a bit more, do a bit more. Come on, you know, rouse energy. But if somebody's already very kind of over controlling towards themselves or like really kind of um, what's the word when you kind of mm, monitor yourself all the time? What's, what's that called? Mm. You kind of. um censor yourself or something not yeah something like that yeah Hard kind of you're monitoring yourself it. you know you're always kind of watching yourself mm. and kind of on your own back really mm. um then what you need is somebody to say relax you know do a little bit less so a different approach is needed to bring you know the mind to a state of calm clarity so you're clear but you're also calm you're not tense you're soft mm. So, yeah, I think it can take away from the mindfulness in the sense that you might be adding a little bit too much ill will there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the end, it has to become internal, you know. I actually don't think these things are rules. Vinaya means restraint. It doesn't mean rules. Um, it means a training in restraint. So... To me, that's not a rule. It's not like a law that we have to abide by. It's a training that we're kind of of our own free will, if you like, of our own choice um, undertaking. And so we undertake it in a way that's going to actually benefit ourselves, not in a way that's going to oppress. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. 
Do the rules complement the precepts? Uh, well, rules. <laughs> I don't like that translation. <laughs> uh, well, the the well, uh, yes, they are the precepts. Yeah, extended. They are the precepts extended. So they are a complement in that. They're more precepts. So yes, it's a it's a refining of the training of sila. I would say um, it's maybe more specified and it's more formalized mm -hmm. precisely to bring a, a community together in harmony, you know, under the same kind of uh, um, understandings of how to behave. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also something that arose in response to particular situations that occurred in the Buddha's day. So it was very much fluid contextual. and uh, contextual mm -hmm. and um, malleable in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Because the those often change the rule depend. So yeah. he had the rule and said, someone says, well, what about this situation? Then he says, okay, well, in this situation, yeah. you don't have to follow the rule. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're not, they're very contextual. They're very contextual. Yeah. Some of them are. Some of them are genuinely, you know, ethical. Yeah, and in that case, I mean, a great idea to go around killing people. Right. I mean, the basic precepts are just general codes of like normal conduct that anybody in the world would agree to. Right. Everybody knows it's not good to steal. It's not good to kill. It's not good to, you know, cheat on your partner or whatever. Um, it's pretty reckless if you drink too much, or some would say drink anything if you want a clear mind um you know it's not going to make you happy and clearer and brighter to take drugs or you know taking drugs is going to distort reality rather than um, bring you closer to truth that you can observe so these things are pretty much laws of nature that apply to everybody and uh, they're the ethical uh, trainings and the others are again more related to specific communities that um undertake to agree to that yeah shall we go to stefano Oh, okay. So, yeah, Stefano, you can. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Stefano is our local. <laughs> yeah. The friendly neighbor. <laughs> so, Rocks now in for tea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good to see you. I was I was just thinking about like a practice and the practice to me, Buddhist practice is about being in touch with reality and being very honest with ourselves. Because I had this problem uh, as well. In fact, I wanted to be too good and do everything, you know, according to the book. Um, but we have to understand what we can, what we cannot do because I've damaged my knees twice. Uh, during the long retreats and it was my fault once not a time uh, this teacher said oh if it hurts you have to keep going and watch the pain but then it actually I damaged the kneecap so be careful <laughs> take it easy but on the other hand we can be self-indulgent and uh, not taking things uh doing things properly see so don't try too hard and not try don't try too little yeah it's my experience and also the other thing is we're like with men we have got these uh kind of like the testosterone driving you to sit harder do longer you know the, the ego gets involved as well yeah. uh, so i have to be careful with that oh, i'm gonna sit for 10 hours the more you know, we tend to quantify things and uh, that doesn't really work that way. I think, I don't know, what do I know? But this is my little experience. I, uh, I think we, we all learn the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> I think it also shows why in the gradual training, the sense restraint, which you could say this is about, right? It's about restraint, goes hand in hand with mindfulness, like the mm -hmm. two kind of roll around each other and strengthen each other. Because it's only really when we see our minds and the way we're relating to things, you know, and um, get very aware of our motivations and am I sitting out of ego or testosterone or, um, you know, a competitive kind of attitude or am I actually sitting because it feels like that's going to get my meditation deeper and it's kind of come about quite naturally um, through letting go. So we become much, much more aware of why we're doing what we are, for example. 
with a benign. Um, in my case, my tummy is really uh, sick, actually, since years and years in Myanmar. So for many years, I've been having some oats in the evening, just a little bit and not anything tasty, <laughs> just literally oats with a bit of water on top. And, you know, I have to be honest with myself. Am I bending the rule and making it tasty because I'm really like increasing, you know, sense desire or am I doing it really out of compassion for my body? And, um, you know, you have to just know these things and be true to yourself. And it doesn't mean always getting it right, as you say, you know, as you said, mm. learning the hard way. I mean, for me, that's an easy one. Um, I think it's much more difficult if it's like a display of different types of chocolate <laughs> and different types of cheese, which somehow gets gets through the Vinaya precepts. <laughs> but uh, always these things should bring us back to ourselves and, and try to deepen the mindfulness. And I do think it can go against deepening mindfulness if we just take it as rules in a book. It's like we're giving our power and our authority and our own inner wisdom away to some kind of external authority uh, that we maybe don't really understand yeah mm. so it has to kind of increase every aspect of the path and ultimately you know that kind of inner assurance as to one's own virtue and integrity yeah so you know why you're doing what you're doing right sampajanya mm. knowing the purpose of these things in the end yeah. it's for our own benefit and if it's not serving that, uh, serving your growth in the path, then some you're mm. not holding it well. Yeah. Yeah. It's or if it's hurting others, because I think another thing that can happen with the Vinaya mm. sometimes, mm. especially I think this is usually when the practice is not so mature. So mm. especially it's mm. more common with young yeah, 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 yeah. We start to impose the training rules on others. So it's like yeah. that person isn't strict. That person did that wrong and they shouldn't do this and they shouldn't do that, you know. And it's not for that. It's not mm. for, um, you know, yeah. telling other people about stuff because that's actually not uh, leading to the benefit of others, mm. right? That's increasing their suffering. Mm. So it should benefit us and it should benefit everyone else. So don't start mm. to be a preacher. It's not very, <laughs> not very inspiring. Yeah. Mm. Want to read so, that one? Okay. I So this is from Richard. I love very much the post of the days and trying to keep the eight precepts. It always makes me happy. Ah, that's, so, that's so nice. That's so nice. Yes. Uh, I. Uh, yeah, because you you don't have to, you know, be busy with the world. How nice. Oh. <laughs> have to. Yeah. So. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's really important that it should lead to happiness. That shows that, you know, you are holding them well, because the whole point of the path is that the Buddha is trying to lead us out of suffering. Mm. So if it's not, it's not really the path. You know, it should lead to happiness. And if it's not, um, the other thing you can do is try to... Um, tune into the happiness that is inherent in living a virtuous life sometimes we do it we live a virtuous life but we don't notice the happiness because it's a kind of very refined thing sometimes it's a happiness of non-remorse or non-regret which you might not notice as happiness but if you do do something that you then regret you'll see the difference you know <laughs> the mind will be really tied up with that and and kind of guilty and feeling horrible about itself um so yeah mm -hmm. Sometimes just noticing the lack of the afflictive emotions is another yeah. cause for rejoicing, I think. Yeah. So, could you please say something about monastic vocation? Have you always known that you wanted to be in a monastery? So, that's from Agatha. Wow. Had you always something about, well, how to summarize that? <laughs> something about the monastic vocation um i'm not sure exactly what you want to know because you could say a lot have you always known yes or no have you always known uh, uh i think it's not always yeah it's not <laughs> always very clear but yeah there is a calling there is a calling yeah whether it's I'm thinking of the other nuns in in my in the monastery in Perth as well. Um, you know, I'm sure none of them thought they would be nuns when they were 15 years old. So it's it's not necessarily something that you've always known. 
But for some, it is like Winnable Chan that he always wanted to. Well, nothing since else. I knew about it, yeah. yeah. But yeah. it wasn't being in a monastery. That is very different to me from renouncing and deepening mm. the practice. It was nothing to do with wanting to be anywhere or wanting to be anything. It was to do with wanting to get out of suffering. And I just, maybe I was lucky to come to the practice in Asia where in my first retreat, the teacher was talking about, well, you know, if you really want to commit your whole life to the practice, of course, being a monk or a nun is bound to, you know, be the best path, basically. And I was like, what? None? <laughs> That's the thing. And I kind of knew it was, right? Because I sort of had heard of these things. Um, but that was it. I knew I want to make the Dhamma the central point in my life. So it was just the obvious thing. Um, but it wasn't about becoming something. It was just about gradually letting go of more. And um, it took several years, probably anyway, it would have taken two or three years of practice and service to feel actually ready. I think by 23, I was really ready. And even people in Burma were telling me, just stay, just join the monastery. It was obvious. That was my interest. But um, still took a lot longer to actually find a place to ordain. So in that sense, a monastery was necessary uh, to have the conditions to ordain. But, um, you know, you never get what you wanted either because it is actually renunciation. Mm. So when you renounce... You're not getting what you thought you were getting. You're not getting anything, actually. You are choosing not to have control. You're actually choosing not to uh, make wanting the driving force of your life. But you're actually sort of saying, right, I'm giving my life to the Dhamma. Let me see where I'm best placed to serve or where I'm best placed to practice. And I've had to say that to myself at times, for example, when my visa ran out in Myanmar, and uh, they wouldn't renew it again, even though it was supposed to be renewable. And I had to go to India. Uh, what a shame. I love India. So it was great because I got to go back to India, which is to me, my motherland, actually, spiritually. Uh, I spent about at least seven years there across 15. So most of my 15 years was in India. Uh, and I went there and was on a retreat. And I remember having this moment of total acceptance. I was like, well, you know, if I'm meant to be back to Burma, let me go. Let the Dhamma just put me in the best place to grow in Dhamma. And I just had this total peace mm -hmm. about whether I'd get the visa or not, you know, because it was very, with that sort of regime, there's nothing logical or fair. It's a dictatorship, right? So if they decide to give you one, they do. And if not, not. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I kind of, that was an intention in a way to have less control. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Shall we ask Sean to speak? Yes, please go ahead, Sean. Hello. Hello. <laughs> two, two questions I have that's off topic from the Sutta, but um, one is kind of like a minor thing, but it keeps playing on my mind. So I have, I have these aphids that are eating plants and things I have, and they, they kill a lot of my nice plants and sometimes I have time to cure them whatever and I never know I mean and the same with things like snails and slugs but particularly aphids at the moment I feel like it's killing my plants and the plants um but at the same time I don't really want to kill obviously you know part of the precepts is not to to kill so that that's one question I've got and then it's the second completely separate question was <clears throat> excuse me this morning I heard a bit of is it Ajahn the ton, I don't know how to say his name. Uh, he was. I wonder if we should ask the first one first. What do you? And then you can go. Yeah, yeah, okay. Quickly, because yeah. I would probably forget both. Yes. <laughs> right, you go for the first one. <gasps> okay. Go? Okay. So this first one is what all Buddhists struggle with because there are cockroaches in the house and snails, slant slugs are eating your, eating your vegetables, and <laughs> birds that eat all the figs before you get to them. <laughs> but uh, I've heard on many occasions, more than once from different people that they talk to the animals and, and, um, uh, and you know, there, there are even paritas, uh, so, you know, uh, like uh, the, uh, the Kanda Parita, which is saying, please leave, please leave. Um, 
please uh, go away go go away you could a chinese nun said she saw with her own eyes a sign in chinese in front of one side of the vegetable patch for the insect saying for 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 the slug saying this is yours don't touch the other side and true enough one side was eaten and the other wasn't wow. this is i mean she's a nun so i'm sure she doesn't lie so what she said it's she saw a sign this side is yours this side is ours wow. it's written in chinese so there must have been chinese slugs <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense about water you know this thing about water Mm -hmm. i just wonder how much of life is sort of this energetic field and Mm -hmm. you know it's like the meaning of the energy of the words that comes through because there's this thing about water what's that documentary called water the great something you have to see it it's all these um japanese uh and oh, other yeah, yeah. the crystals how... crystals yeah yeah and you yeah. put for example rice in one glass of water and then well say in three glasses of water and on one you write the word love on another one you just ignore it mm. and on the other one you write the word hate or something like that and you have these three and you see what happens and the one with love and that you kind of yeah I think the word love is there um it becomes kind of fermented the one that you ignore becomes moldy and the one that says hate becomes kind of black and yucky. And other people have experimented. I mean, watch it properly because you can't do the experiment unless you get the details. But it's really incredible, you know, like, is there an energy because of the association with those words? Um, it's very fascinating. But that's an aside anyway. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's talk inside. talk to the uh, aphids. Try. I'll try it. Slugs. Huh. <laughs> Look, look, look. I talked to the ants in my house. I asked them to leave. They stayed. <laughs> Maybe the, the Chinese are. There is the Kanda Paritta. I mean, in monastics, chant this all the time. The Kanda Paritta. For um, uh, insects and uh, big and small animals that could come and disturb you. So, But also, you could try and put your plants somewhere that then less likely to come. I don't know how that might work. Or is there something you that would just kind of not kill them, but kind of move mm. them off, off or, or detract mm. them mm. in some way? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just very difficult. Very. Yeah. But I can. Yeah. Did, should I ask my other question or did you want to read the uh, comments? Well, somebody, somebody just, just said, said, Grace. Grace said a suggestion. Unleashing right. ladybugs on them. Ladybirds, we call it in England. Oh. Yeah. Ladybirds? Ladybirds. We don't have so many these days. Oh, yes, actually, I just read. I actually did just read that potentially, uh, yeah, they help ladybirds. But then I think I might have an invasion of ladybirds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should we just read out the other comments related to that? Because I do like to include everybody's comments. Pick the snails and put them somewhere away from your garden. That's what I do. <laughs> and then uh, someone saying, unfortunately, I'm not a non, so asking and pleading doesn't work for me. I don't think that re- really matters if you're a non or not. <laughs> but yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, I've made my peace with mosquitoes. I've let them bite me whenever they want it's only a tiny speck of blood anyway I have plenty and they've stopped biting me Mm -hmm. I also have a feral cat that comes every day and she has fleas I'm presuming she has more than one Mm. (laughs) if I put flea medication on her that's killing the fleas yeah of course but you have to always kind of consider what's the most compassionate thing to do Mm -hmm. all around so you know sometimes we have to accept that as human beings we can't live completely harmless lives Mm -hmm. that's the nature of samsara and the real solution, actually, if you really want to be harmless, is to get out of samsara. It's actually the only solution in the end. So we can minimize harm, but we can't actually prevent it completely. It's impossible. I mean, otherwise you won't take antibiotics, you won't take anything, right? A monk that I know said he did a lot of metta to some mice who were in his cooties. Kuti, they didn't come during the Vasa. Yeah, I mean, 
yeah it may or may not work but I do think life is very imperfect mm. anyway shall we let Sean read his um say his second we've only got a few minutes like three minutes oh. um, yes. so the second one was um yeah I listened this morning uh is it Adjun? I don't have to say his name the turn the turn he's from um Thailand he's uh he was under Ajahn Chah he was at one of the Australian um monasteries speaking do you know who I'm referring to you can't say his name it's <laughs> D-T-U-N. D-T-U-N. Oh, dumb. oh yes yes, dumb, dumb. Dumb. yes. He D- okay and anyway he said the one thing that's very important and I've read something else he said as well is to reflect upon death and things like that and do it in your meditation and I do remember Venerable Chanda you saying that this was something you did for a long time if you could maybe give some suggestions on how to do that within a meditation oh, what was that last part um so that he said to reflect upon um death in your meditation particularly so I was wondering I know you I think you've done a lot of this so if you had some suggestions on exactly how to do that within meditation that's quite a big topic I don't know that I've done it a lot okay but um I think it's very helpful to practice death meditation from time to time um even at the beginning of a sit it can be done but you were doing that just this morning Mm. so maybe you should say what you did Well, um, I think it's important to find something that works for you. So you could have a formula, but if it doesn't strike your heart, it's not not very useful. So um, you have to find uh, something in for yourself, some kind of Im- reflection, uh, imagination that that strikes that strikes you personally. So there are, I mean, formulas, but uh, I, I for, for myself, have invented my own way of reflecting that makes me, the, the result is that I go like, why am I worried about this? You know, this is not worth getting upset over. So personally, I, I reflect on, on you know, I, I have, like sansara how extremely many long lifetimes i have had i have done this before many times for for me that is for me it's like uh, don't worry about it kind of it has that effect on me so uh, i'm going to am i going to keep doing this for the rest of you know sansara getting upset about this 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 ridiculous thing uh, in in twenty million lifetimes, I'll be upset about the same thing. Ah, oh, thanks. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so whatever catches your imagination and helps you to have that perspective of this is it's uh, yeah not always yeah. getting on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that Ajahn Vermali's uh, death contemplations are really nice. Mm. But also, um, I like to do one where I'm kind of imagining myself kind of dying, you know, and then also uh, even go to the point where I'm dead. And imagine yourself just lying in this coffin or lying on the ground and you see yourself there like dead, you know, and it really brings home that this is going to be your future right you're going to be dead and then imagine from that perspective looking at your life a little bit and thinking what really mattered in my life like what did I do or not do that was really important like what are those key qualities that I can like reflect and feel happy about or not so happy about in my life and it just seems to put things in perspective Mm -hmm. and you can do that with other people that have died maybe somebody that was very dear but not too dear uh, not who you're going to have a lot of grief arising for, but you um, just imagine them too. Imagine them alive, talking, chatting, all their friends, their family, and then, you know, and then remembering them sick and remembering mm-hmm. them dead. If you've seen them or if you've seen their coffin or been to their funeral, you know, you imagine that and you imagine also what they 
did the kind of things that they valued the people that they loved and you know and um yeah the fact that just like they were so alive at one point we have that life in us now but eventually we we'll, we too will be dead so what do we really want to do with our lives i think yeah like you say is that perspective isn't it that it gives that can be so sobering and and really um yeah help us to prioritize or reprioritize our lives and also love more right love the people that are in our lives it's not like okay uh you know my life's gonna end there's no point kind of with this or with that it might actually mean yeah you can do what you do but do it with more love or do it with less attachment to outcome you know if you're very busy you've got too many responsibilities like yeah you can maybe do a bit less but just do it better like mother Teresa said something like um was it Mother Teresa? We're not asked to do great things. We're asked to do small things with great love. And that's so wonderful. You know? So it's like, what, what how do you want people to remember you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh look at that i wear t-shirts with skulls on to remind me of impermanence it helps me live life with appreciation so yay you get creative get creative that's yeah i've seen some of your cool wear and <laughs> yeah it's cool because it kind of brings you out it brings other people out as well it's like whoa what's that <laughs> cool all right, it's actually time over, but we still have uh, uh, Manoi. Ah, yeah, okay. we usually give five minutes. Okay. We had a rich okay. class and we yes. got through a whole one paragraph. <laughs> yeah. It was a very important, very, yeah. very poor one. Yeah. Yes. Quantity, yes. not quality. Yes. So, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you, everybody. That was really very, thank you. very For sad. For taking sad. the lead and all your yeah. wisdom. Um, yeah interesting yes. ways of presenting your understanding that are engaging oh mm. refreshing yes yes <laughs> yeah so that was a wonderful sort of discussion when it was and uh, uh, as you know today's discussion was offered on a donation basis and in the spirit of generosity any contribution that you will be able to make will be greatly gratefully received and they'll be able to help uh, in the Viharas day-to-day -day runnings. And also, this is very important. It is for development of England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. So I'll add a link in the chat. So uh, that is the donation link. And also, if you are capable, you can provide a food dana to Venerables by visiting the Vihara. And there are, there are several more ways to get involved um, by getting into a couple of WhatsApp groups that provide uh, when there's no bookings for dana made or um, uh, one of volunteering for various work at Vihara or a weekly supermarket delivery. Uh, so these are organized by our email address team at anukampaproject.org. And you can contact that and one of our volunteers will um, guide us uh, on that. Uh, thank you very much. And also, please look at our, the events in the website and in the Facebook. Uh, all those events are updated there and uh, hopefully you would have got the latest newsletter as well it has a lot of links and the uh, events as well thank you can i add specifically that there'll be a one day retreat on sunday by myself in london and uh, my non-self <laughs> and uh the following week online one day retreat uh which you can come to whatever time zone you're in, because I don't think anyone's going to mind if you're not there the whole day. Um, and of course, Ajahn Pramali's events, which we really want you to book up for, because I know many of you want to come, but no one's booked. And it does freak us out a bit on our end, because there's only like three or four people in some of those talks. And I'm like, we've got to pay however much to the venue, but not really that. It's more that 
Mm. Poor Ajahn Brahmali. We want him to like come and feel really kind of, yeah, like people are eager to hear more about early Buddhism from a great meditator and scholar monk. So we really want to make him feel welcome. So if you are intending to come or even not yet, please find out more about that. And uh, mm. and yeah, you're very welcome. There's many events, some in Oxford, some in uh, one in Bristol, uh, Sheffield, where else? London, etc. So there'll be record too, but you know it's not the same. So mm. hope you can come along. Yay! Mm. That's it. Thank you, everybody, and we can unmute you. It's lovely to see the three of you there, Daniel, Liam, and Erica. Look at them. <laughs> <laughs>